What I'm saying is don't settle. Don't live lives of complacency because there is so much out there for us. We all have the right to live incredibly fulfilled, incredibly passionate, incredibly joyful lives where you are psyched it's Monday morning. Benjamin, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Chris. Good to be here. Appreciate it. I want to start with a quote from your Instagram. It is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well have not lived at all, in which case you fail by default. That's a JK Rowling quote. What's that mean to you? Uh, so if you, if you, you can play it safe, right? You can play it so safe in life that um, there are no risks. You know, it's basically, it's, it's think of the parallel to exercise. You can live such a life that you will not get hurt exercising. What that looks like is sitting on the couch all day long. So there is an inherent risk that you will get hurt the moment you do any form of exercise or try and get shape in any way, shape, or form. And that's the parallel to life. If you are going to try to do anything meaningful in your life, there is an inherent risk that you will not succeed. That should not stop you because if you don't try, you're, you're failing by default. You're, you're not going to um, live a life of any sort of meaningfulness, fulfillment, or impact on anybody else. And that's kind of my measure of success is, is your life meaningful, fulfilled, and does it have an impact on other people? So get out there and go do it. It seems to me that you make quite prudent decisions. Do you have to push yourself to take risks sometimes? Yeah, I think that, uh, so I'm an entrepreneur, so, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not quite as risk averse as many other people, but you know, I, it, it's probably built into being, I'm being an entrepreneur, I think it's probably built into my DNA a little bit that I want, I'm so, um, so driven to live a, a life that I'm proud of. So driven to live a life of meaning and uh, joy and happiness. And um, I don't want to put that off for anything. So because of that, I think I'm willing to take more risks along the way. Case in point, um, when after um, graduating from college, university, um, I got a really secure job doing finance and um, I wasn't feeling fulfilled so I took the big, massive risk and left the corporate ladder, the security of the paycheck, and this really nice um, career path, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just moved out to become a ski bum for a year to try to figure it out. Because to me, the risk of not living a life to its fullest meaning is essentially a nightmare. It's hell on earth. Like living not – on your terms, not taking control and not doing something that you want to do is, um, is not the way I want to go about things. So because of that, I think that's, I, I don't even, when I'm making those decisions, I don't necessarily saying like, whoa, this is going to be really risky. It's just, is the alternative complacency. And if the alternative is complacency, I'm out and I want the other path. What do you say to people that need that bit more of a push? maybe feel a little bit unsatisfied with where they're at, but are struggling to take action? Well, I don't. I don't say it to them because it's their choice to make. And I'm not here to say that the risk is worth the effort because everyone has a different um, risk aversion and risk um, willingness scale. And what I say is, um, like there are certain plenty of things that I don't want to do. Like I, you know, I don't want to go free solo up El Capitan. Like that's not, that's too risky for me, but for somebody else that might be totally within their wheelhouse. So for me to put my value system on what is risky and what is not, um, I'm not here to do that. So if somebody's like, should I make the leap? Should I make the jump? That's something that you got to listen to. And when I say listen to, it's not a matter of weighing out the pros and cons on a piece of paper. Listen, you know, one side, here's all the things that would go right. Here's all the things that could go wrong. To me, it's, Listen to your gut because your gut has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years of 
evolutionarily, evolutionary biology built into that DNA that's helping guide that decision. And if it feels not right in your guts, it probably isn't right. So that's something that people I think can come a little bit more in tune with is what is their gut. I think we're so, um, you know, in today's world, influenced to be logical beings. That's what, you know, we say like changes us from the apes is like that we have the prefrontal cortex. We can think, we're the only animals that can think about our thoughts. Whereas everyone else has the lizard brain, the amygdala, and we kind of, they operate on instinct. I think we've lost a little bit of instinct and we try to um, rationalize everything. And I think that the gut is the thing that can uh, that should guide more decision making along the way if what we're truly looking for is to live meaningful, impactful lives. Dude, I've been thinking about this so much recently. The cool. the fact that we pray at the altar of cognitive horsepower so much, right? We just believe that we can wrangle the world around us through just sheer cerebral weight, right? Here's a, here's a, a story. So um, halfway through last year, I got put on really, really boring, normal medication and I didn't realize, but when the doctor said you need to up the dose, I didn't know that it was an anticholinergic. Do you know what that is? No. Okay, so choline is one of the neurotransmitters that makes your brain work, basically. When you take nootropics, many of them have choline in them. And over a little bit of time, my thoughts ended up being super muddy. Like I pride myself on having agile thoughts, right? I'm a podcaster. My, that's my money. Right? I need to be able to think quickly. What's in my head needs to come out of my mouth. One day I was out for a walk and it took me 90 seconds to remember a town that I've been to 10 times, like to remember mm. the name of it. I'm thinking, okay, there's a there's some sort of a problem here. And it makes you start to doubt and and feel very conscious of the fact that you don't have the ability to fix the problems the same way. And then I realized what it was, dropped the dose, everything was fine, totally reversible. But what I felt for a small amount of time was basically like, kind of like a dementia type situation, just a restriction in my processing ability. And I spoke to a friend whose dad had dementia and he said, this illness has taken everything from me. It's even taken myself. And what he means by that is when we are people that rely on our brains to get us out of problems, like I know that no matter what the situation is that I get myself into, I can probably think my way to a solution that will get myself out of it. And there's something that's so brutal about degenerating your ability to think because it, it's killing your ability to fix the problems, mm. not just giving you problems as well. Yeah, I think – so that is – I mean, so the cognitive thinking, the thinking brain, the problem solving, that is what <laughs> – I don't want to diminish that at all because that's what gave us the light bulb. It's why we're able to talk across an ocean. It gave us everything that we have as human beings. So it's the, it is the most powerful thing that we have. I just believe that we've, we've become too reliant on it and we're not. And because of that, we can rationalize everything away for logical reasons. I can't quit my job because X, Y, Z and A, B and C. It makes no sense to quit my job. Meanwhile, we live unfulfilled lives because we're not willing to take the step forward and do something that your gut is screaming at you going, let's go be happy. Let's find joy. Let's go for a walk in nature. I know you have those 19 emails you need to respond to, but this is, you know, it's, you know, I've, I've been reading a lot about, um, marketing recently and it's, it, it's, we run our businesses this way. We run our businesses based off because you can find any data and we, run, we, we dive into the data, yet we can't logically explain why advertisements with animals in them do better than advertisements that don't. And we don't need to respond. We don't need to rationalize. We don't need to figure out everything out logically. Some things are just magic, right? Some things are just built so far into our biology as human beings that we're not going to be able to figure it out and put it on a spreadsheet. Not everything is ex you know, able to f fit into an Excel document. Some things are literally just feel and emotions. And as much as we, you know, it goes back to like the Simon Sinek thing is people don't buy what you do. They, they buy why you do it. And 
that goes right down to the root of everything. Well, forget about all of this. You know, we, we started this with this risk thing. Um, don't try to weigh and measure it. Just listen to your gut. And this is right down to like people that are trying to figure out like, should I stay with my partner or not? You know, I'm not fulfilled in my relationships. Should I stay with my, and you go like, well, I should because, um, that's how I create, uh, you know, some sort of steadiness in my life, whether it's financial or routine or it's what, what will my friends and family think, or what will my religious group think, or what would the alternative be? Is it being alone and all these things? And this is the reason people settle and become complacent and they end up living with a non-supportive what, you know, wife or husband. It is either, in my opinion, it is either you live in an incredibly passionate, supportive, trusting relationship, or you don't have a relationship. There is no middle. It's it, it, to me, it is binary. Where people go like, well, it's okay because you know, if I if I move out, it's gonna be really tough to um, support myself and my kids, and I won't see my kids as much, and we'll stay together for the kids. And this is why people live, you know, are afraid to take the leap to leave their job, to leave their. Sp- I'm not, and I'm not on. I'm not here, you know, promoting like people go quit your jobs, go to get divorced. What I'm saying is don't settle. Don't live lives of complacency because there is so much out there for us. We are all – we all have the right to live incredibly fulfilled, incredibly passionate, incredibly joyful lives where you are psyched it's Monday morning, where you are psyched that you're in quarantine with your family where you are psyched that you get to do what you do every single day. And if something doesn't line up that way, don't put it off. This is your life. No one is going to come and change it for you. I think that we all kind of wait for, because it's what we grew up with our entire lives. Mom and dad will do this. Then teachers will do this. Then society tells us to do this. And then it's all pre-programmed for us. And by the time we have control over our lives as functioning adults in society, we're programmed. We're programmed to follow the script. And we go, well, the script is going to change eventually. And then the next thing that people look forward to is retirement. And by the time you're in retirement, you think that that's where you're going to kick it. That's where you're going to be in the hammock with the, 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 the drink with the umbrella in it and be able to have fun. And by that time, You've given up your passions. You've given up your hobbies. You haven't lived a life that you want to, and you hope that you're going to finally get there, and it's not there for you. Don't wait. Like, take the risks to make it happen today. No one's coming to do it for you at all. Absolutely not. You rely a lot on being procedural with your efforts. You've got this awareness, intention, action framework that you follow. And a lot of people that are listening are going to be intentional actors as well. Personal development, self-development, thinking about their work throughout the day. How do you balance being intentional with trying to have that intuitive sense come in as well? Do you feel attention at all there? No, I think it's all, it's, it's one and the same and it's self-awareness. So, um, Everything to me starts with awareness, whether you're trying to make changes in your life or you're trying to figure out your strengths and weaknesses, you're trying to figure out what you, um, how to become happy. It literally all, so let's take that one. Let's, we're trying to become happy because I think that truly is the shared purpose across humanity. We can call it what we want, Ch- interchange that word for happy for enlightened, call it finding God, call it pure consciousness, call it whatever you want to. That's what we all have as a shared purpose. Call it evolution, right? The evolution of our of ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. That's what we all have as a shared common purpose. Now, everyone has their own unique purpose as well, which is their talents, and it changes based off of opportunities and where you are in your life. But that shared purpose of happiness, that's that level of awareness just of that, like knowing that that's what we should all be chasing. That's what we all are looking for. Now, if that's the case, what are the things that make me happy? And it's a simple exercise is like, get out a piece of paper 
and I do it on my notes on my phone, I do this every so often, is make a running list that you can cross off and add to of the things that make you happy. And what you'll find is, and I'm not talking like in the moment, I'm not talking about like getting high. I'm not talking like, um, you know, watching funny movies, although that might make the list. But what you'll find is things that make you happy might not make you happy in the moment, but they do eventually. And my list involves things like you would expect. Um, you know, I like exercising. It makes me feel good. I like being in nature. I like, um, I, but I also like building things. I like working with teams. I like leading people. I like being creative. I like thinking about the future. I like um, breaking things down into frameworks. I like doing yard work. Like, and you create these lists. And then what you do is you become where you're, where you're saying before, then you create intentionality around creating those moments. No one's coming to do those things for you. If you find fulfillment and joy and happiness being going for nature walks, then schedule those in and schedule it in the way you would schedule in a dentist appointment where when it comes, you don't push it off for something else. It's the thing that's, so now we have the awareness of truly aware of what's going to make me happy. The intentionality of this is going to happen if I don't do this. It's not going to, and then the, the action, like if you, we can talk about it all we want and talking about it does make me feel good. Just like everyone talking about it, but that's the trap because you talking about your goals actually elicits the same dopamine as actually doing your goals. So it's a, it's a trick and you have to recognize that. It's the actual doing that moves us forward. It is truly not until we take the steps that we go anywhere. So that's why the that three-step process of awareness, intentionality, and action is kind of that, you know, the, the three pillars that I think move people towards that, you know, you fill in the blank. Finding God, <laughs> pure consciousness, um, enlightenment, or just joy, like joy in their lives. And I if we don't operate in that circular fashion of constant flywheel of awareness, intention, action, awareness, because when you take action, you get greater levels of awareness. Did this truly help me move me towards my goals or not? And then you move and you iterate. It's the lean startup model. It's the build, measure, learn, right? Let's take action. Let's just build it. We don't have to wait for perfect. Let's jump, grow wings on the way down, learn, iterate and make adjustments along the way. And if you keep on that flywheel, eventually you'll get to, and it's not going to happen immediately, but eventually you get closer and closer to that end state. And you enjoy the process along the way because you're making the adjustments with intentionality, not just getting pushed by anybody else or society. I don't know what the next book plan is, but I think that that should be one of the ones before you hang up the writing pen. I think that that, huh. that framework is, is worthy of a book. Noted. Good. Uh, <laughs> talking about big risks news recently when Dave Castro was let go by CrossFit HQ, although he might not be technically a leader, he's definitely a big figurehead in the sport in a lot of people's eyes. What were your thoughts on that? Uh, I, so the first one was surprise. I actually, um, I was coaching the five thirty AM class at the gym and I came in and started coaching and, um, the members act, my members actually told me, um, cause I hadn't checked social or anything like that. So my first reaction was surprise and I, I, I remember it. Um, and I was surprised mostly because I thought if it was going to happen, it would have happened right. As new leadership comes in, um, the easiest thing to do is to rip off band-aids. Clean house all it, at once. Yeah. Yeah, just clean house. And they did that, right? They 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 made a lot of shifts and a lot of changes. Um, but Dave was there. So that was my initial reaction. But then with a little bit of hindsight and a little bit more perspective and a little thought, um the the timing of the change actually does make sense. So if we remember back when Rosa took over for Glassman, that was um it was late spring or early summer, somewhere in there. And the games were looming, right? The games were around the corner and it was in the midst of a pandemic. So this is where they had to scrape together a completely new format where they did an online qualifier and they invited five guys and five girls to Aromas, California. 
So to do that with complete new leadership on the game side would have been um, probably too risk. And I think it was the smart move for Eric to Rosa not to make that move. So then it puts us into that next season. And I think that, you know, from there's a little bit of stability now. So it, it actually makes sense from a timing perspective in my, in my view. Um, it was not the, the ship has kind of like settled a little bit. So a little bit of rocking can be withstood and the timing does seem to make sense now. So while it was initial shock because I thought it would have happened, it's that dissipated fairly quickly. Um, because here's my personal opinion on it. I think Dave did a really good job running the games. I think from an organizational standpoint and from a programming standpoint, the games are a phenomenal test and a terrific showcase. They would not, I don't think they would be what they are without Dave Castro. Um, but I can see why Eric might think that a change is necessary to get the sport to where he wants it to go. Um, why is that? In um, Dave is polarizing. I mean, um, Dave wore shirts that said unapologetic. That was his tagline. It's like, so unapologetic means don't take ownership in my mind. That's polarizing. Now, um, Dave would swear on TV. So to get to the next level, right? To get to the, um, um, the next place, I think it, it could, I'm not saying it, I'm, I'm not, I don't have enough inner workings knowledge of the, of how it, it shakes up, but I can understand the reasons for it. Um, you know, strangely enough, you know, I've, I've, I've known Dave for a fairly long time. And I think that the last two games, the one in Aromas with five people, five guys, five girls, and the last one, um, Dave did as good a job as he's ever done from a athlete relations standpoint. So I actually didn't see this coming because again, I, if it was going to happen, I thought it was going to happen. And Dave did a really good job of, of being a better leader. I would and say I saw, the growth, I saw the growth of him as a leader over the last two years. So I, I was surprised because I saw it moving in the right direction. I've definitely seen Dave be more cantankerous in the past than he has done recently. Yeah. It's, um, it's so interesting. There's a lot of been conversations in our gym about this. And I think the polarizing nature of Dave has trickled down to people as well. There seems to be sort of broadly two camps of people, people that can't believe that he's gone and it's an absolute travesty and people, it, it was overdue. Dave, you know, doesn't fit the new vision that we have for CrossFit. Now, one of the things that's interesting is it depends on what Eric's uh, vision, I think, for the sport is long term whether or not you want to be on ESPN, whether or not you want to be able to commercialize more, whether or not you want to have that increasingly professional sort of stance. But there is still a huge, huge group of people in CrossFit that like the anti-marketing movement, the underground fitness mentality. And I think that, you know, uh, when Greg went, that was that was a a little bit of a peer into a culture that maybe hadn't caught up with the modern era quite so much. And you see, you know, some of the media team went as well. They were some of the more outspoken guys as well. Okay, then they've gone. And Castro kind of was a little bit like, well, what the fuck's that guy doing there? Like, how's he, <laughs> how's he still there? But then you think, well, he's a programming genius. Some of the workout, think about, uh, was it 20.1? The wall, was that wall walks? Yep. That workout is one of the smartest workouts. Like he destroyed top level athletes with a wall, like, absolutely destroyed them. And I, I think that his programming is beautiful. He was the third ever podcast that I did on this show three, four years ago, uh, the uh, eighteen point zero announcement. And um, he's a polarizing figure, but he gave the sport character. There's an element of that edge to him, and I think that you're probably right. It's a case of where does CrossFit, where does Eric want CrossFit to be long term? Yeah. So I can, I can give uh, my two cents into that because I've had conversations with Eric and he's told me that. Now, this might, be, this might have changed because uh, I had these conversations when Eric first came in. So I had a, a couple conversations with him in his first weeks on the job. Um, and 
his view. So here's Glassman was not a fan of the CrossFit Games. He actually think it clouded the vision of what CrossFit was supposed to be. Eric is a huge fan of the CrossFit Games, like a fan boy. Like he loves it. He competes in it himself. He's very he loves it. Eric, whereas Greg saw it as a sideshow and at best and more realistically, probably a, a massive distraction. Eric sees it as a avenue for a, a huge part of the growth of CrossFit as a whole. These athletes represent the pinnacle of what we can all aspire to be. And he's looking to have a viewership of a hundred million people. That's a massive number. Do you know what it is so, currently? Uh, I would guess it's in the neighborhood of single digit millions. So, but even if it's 10 million, that's a 10 X growth that puts it on par with like, so I think the Super Bowl gets like 300 million or something like that. So that puts it on par with like normal NFL playoff type things. It puts it above UFC. Like it's a huge, huge number. And He's, he's used UFC as a parallel for the sport. So in order for that to happen, and then you start to realize what his responsibilities are, whereas Glassman's responsibilities were to the legacy of CrossFit. The methodology. The methodology. That's what his responsibilities were. And to... Forge elite fitness and to get people off the carbs and off the couch. That's basically what he was, his missions. And then he took that to like this revolutionary and um, let's go fight big soda and those type of things and let's try to change the world. Eric's, so Eric didn't buy CrossFit. I think that's a misnomer. Um, Eric headed up a group that he got a bunch of people to invest in CrossFit. So he's responsible for their investments like anybody would. Once you get backed by private equity, you have to, you're responsible for it. So he has to grow this thing. And I think that that probably is at the heart of the Dave thing as much as anything. Um, Dave might've been part of the old guard. I don't know this now I'm speculating, yep. but Dave might've been part of the old guard and like, this is the way we're going to do it. Um, or the polarizing aspect of it didn't allow for enough, um, upside swing of growth potential. Yeah. So they might need to get somebody that is willing to completely sit in the background again, speculation completely not have and let a, um, somebody else be the face of this thing. When you know, I whether, it's the, whether it's the whether it's the athlete, you know, Roger Goodell is not the face of the NFL, you know, and even Dana White is stepping back as the face of UFC and letting the athletes be them. Mm -hmm. Or you have a true personality come in and be the face of it, you know, like a Rory McKernan or a Pat Sherwood or something like that. Somebody that you know, um, again, this is me speculating in my opinions. I'd have said that Dave could have filled that Dana role quite nicely. I think he's got a little bit of edge. He's got the reputability from having been there from the very, very beginning. You see somebody like Dana that is a uh, very, he's the fight maker, right? Or that's one of his main roles. And he's a common thread that ties together very, very early days with current days. And he's been there through the Reebok buyout, then Venom buyout and fighters coming and going and acquisitions and stuff like that and it is nice i think to have that you know it's eric's decision or whatever and it'll be interesting to see what happens as someone who doesn't have their money um based on the uh what dave decides to say on a microphone or the t-shirts that he wears or the hairdo that he mm. turns up with uh, i would have much <laughs> preferred to see uh, dave castro continue to uh, be the guy that programs the games and is there announcing and doing all of that stuff uh, however, from a business perspective, I can see why that wouldn't work. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not going business first leads to a better experience down the road or whether um, sticking to the old school core principles would have been a, a more effective strategy. But I guess yeah. time will tell with time stuff will like tell. that. Uh, 
you said recently talking about leadership and stuff like that, you said that you weren't a born leader. How so? Ooh. Um, so I, I actually, when I was younger, I would take personality tests. Um, it would come up that I was a phenomenal follower. You'd give me directions, tell me what to do. And I go off marching and do it and, um, do a pretty good job of it. That's, um, transformed, um, as, as I've gotten older. So that's the first piece. The second piece is I'm extremely introverted, still am. I'd much rather be a, um, a wallflower at a party than, um, the center of attention and even talking to people at all. Honestly, I'd rather just listen. Um, you know, it, in terms of like, if you define extroverts and introverts, if, um, being around other people, um, gives you energy or takes energy away from you, being around other people takes energy away from me. I'd rather be um, creating stuff on my own. So it's effort. It's a lot of effort for me to um, try to have conversations and try to communicate with people and hold people to certain levels of standards and expectations and share the vision and create common threads throughout an organization or a teams. Um, but I've learned to, honestly, being a coach has kind of helped transform that a little bit. Because when you're a coach, that's the job. The coach's job is to be the leader of an individual or a team. So it's allowed me to, um, you know, grow my wings a little bit um, as I've gone through this process. But uh, my natural inclination is um, probably not leader first. It's something that I've uh, struggled with. And, and frankly, when I started putting myself in a leadership position as an entrepreneur, it was something I was, uh, pretty poor at. And I think that even today, you know, 15 to 20 years into this journey, um, I'm mediocre at, like, it's something that I'm continuing to try to learn. But as we talked about before, that self-awareness is the big, the big thing we need to start with. And then, we create some intention and take actions beyond that. But, you know, if um, when there is a crisis, I'm not the guy that's like, let's go do it. Charge into the fray. Let's go take. It's like, dang. <laughs> oh, man, this is going to require a lot. Like that's that's my that's my into it. That's my gut. That's who I am as a person. You know, I uh, avoid conflicts massively. I'd much rather have people like me than kind of like jump into it. And it's a lot of work for me to have tactful conflict resolution. It's a lot of work for me to pick up the phone and have a phone call. It's so much easier for me to sit on the sidelines and just hope it all works out. I've learned that's not the best methodology. Have you just, have for you just tumbled into this position then? Because all of these things are reasons why you should absolutely suck. At doing yes, absolutely. Your, your job. You shouldn't be the leader of a team. You shouldn't be the leader of a business. You shouldn't have an online platform that you know thousands and thousands of people follow and trying to make the best CrossFit or see, like fitness gym in the world and stuff. Like, how the fuck did you get here? Um, I stumbled into it. Yeah, yeah. It, um, I opened up a gym because I was super passionate about fitness as a means to get people to become the best versions of themselves. You know, if we are that, it's that same shared purpose we all have. So here's, I believe that our training methodology, training really hard is as worthy a means to, in, to enlightenment as anything that's ever existed. Meaning people can choose any one of these tools, whether it's meditating, journaling, going to church, AA. Art, like, dance, music. Like art. Like all of those things are ways for people to find pure consciousness, to find themselves and find joy, to find awareness about self-awareness about who they are. I believe that hard training, not um, jazzercise, but what we do, because what we do, the greatest adaptation, and yeah, we get ripped and you get lean and you lower triglycerides and you increase your longevity and your functionality. The biggest adaptation is between the ears. You like the, you, you're, you're a different human being in your brain from having experienced this path. And that's what I believe from day one. That's why I wanted to open up a gym. 
was because I believed I could help change people from the inside out to leave more purpose driven lives. And when I opened up a gym, I was even before that I was a personal trainer and doing it from a personal training standpoint, that's kind of my sweet spot. One on one, build a relationship and we can do that. And then from there, things kind of went really well. And I got a little following and it made sense to open up a gym. So I opened up a gym and then it becomes this thing where, okay, now this is going well and we need to hire coaches. And that's where the thing starts. Once you have to lead other employees, the thing changes. And then we created a team that competed at the CrossFit games. And okay, now you have to lead that team and we win the CrossFit games. Oh my gosh. Now people want to follow you. So you create an online platform and that starts to snowball and then it creates, turns into a revenue stream and now you have a business underneath you. So yeah, it was, um, I wouldn't say reluctantly cause I've enjoyed all the steps, but it was, um, organically. It just yeah. kind of, I didn't, I didn't seek out a leadership position and, um, it, it doesn't, it's not part of who I am at, at, on a, on a molecular level. It seems like a, a career, a series of stumbling down a set of stairs. And at each step that you've arrived at, it's just been another challenge that you've needed to do. And it's like, well, I'm the guy. It looks like I'm the guy. I much prefer that sort of a story when it comes to uh, entrepreneurialism, athleticism, building a team, creating an organization or a movement or a culture or a podcast or whatever it is. I much prefer that sort of story because I think that on average, far more people end up in positions like that by following their passion, not really being able to predict the future that much, maybe just kind of knowing one or two steps in front of them. And then before they know it, they look back after five or 10 years and go, holy shit, look at all of this stuff that we've built. And it creates anxiety, this sort of ambient anxiety amongst people that don't have a plan when they don't have a plan. And they think, oh, well, look, the, 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 what Ben got to the stage with the online and the gym and the team and the CrossFit games and the stuff, he must have laid all out. And he got, you can get through this by just doing your best as challenges arise and taking opportunities as they arise. And then in retrospect, anybody can piece together some bullshit story about how I knew it was going to be this. And I, the vision with originally start off with the personal training. And I knew at that moment I was going to take a team to the CrossFit. No, horseshit. Like the vast, vast, vast majority of people stumble into their success, like falling down a set of stairs. There's a dichotomy with that though, because on a personal level, yes and sort of, and then once you have a team, no. So here's what I mean by that is from a personal level, I think it really helps to have a vision of what it is you're chasing, but it doesn't need the, the you don't have to have the steps built out. You can just have the North Star. Right. And the North Star, there's a reason it's a North Star because you can purposely go off track. When a plane leaves New York City headed for San Francisco, it's off track 99% of the time. It could be tens and dozens and dozens of miles off track. But as you get closer and closer, it gets more narrow and narrow and narrow. And certainly when you go to landing time, you want to be right on the button. And that's much like starting a business. When I started a business, I didn't know what I was trying to create. I couldn't have told you we're going to have comp train and we're going to have um, you know, six different gyms around, but I knew what I wanted. This gets back to what we originally started the conversation with. I knew what I wanted from a feel. I knew what the feeling I wanted was. And that is when we get done running a class at our gym, I don't want people to leave. That was the feeling. And if we create this place where people feel like once they leave, they're going to have this FOMO, this fear of missing out, this is truly the best hour of their day and they don't want it to end. So when the workout ends, they're hanging out. Then we've created a transformational experience for them. Now, transformational is the opposite of transactional. Transactional is um, I pay you, you pay me, I provide a service, and then you we – we, 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 we shake hands and it's over. Most businesses are transactional. You hire someone to paint your house, they paint your house, you pay them and it's gone. 
What I wanted to do was not be a transactional coach. And a transactional coach, if we're coaching basketball, they teach you how to do um, a triangle offense, run a full court press, how to um, square up your shoulders when you shoot a basketball, and how to defend a pick and roll. And when you're done playing basketball, they haven't done much for you. Whereas a transactional coach makes you a better person. They teach you discipline. They teach you how to work through adversities. They teach you how to be more humble and a better teammate. And what I wanted to do was to create a business that was not transactional but transformative. That changed people so when they were no longer a part of our business, whether that was once they went home and they spent the other 23 hours of their day, they were different people. Or after they moved out of the state and they were no longer able to come to our gym, they were different people for having experienced our services. I knew from day one that I wanted that. And the ability to, as then a leader, to share that vision is a necessity. You have to be able to share that with your team. If you don't have that aspect of what we're trying to create, you're at a loss. Because we are default, you're going to default to making sure that the things on the scoreboard are happening. Because the only thing you can do is say that the measurables are in place. And that's what everyone's running their businesses now because there's more data than there's ever been. So what people are doing is they're going, okay, did we make X number of calls? Did that lead to X number of trans, uh, uh, conversions? Did those conversions lead to this many um, sale uh, onboarding session? Did those onboarding sessions lead to this much of a churn rate? Did that lead to this much of an average client lifetime value? Okay, let's spin that back up to what is our customer acquisition cost? Average lifetime value versus customer acquisition cost. Here we go. We're in the positive. Let's pour more fuel on the fire. And they think that's how to run a business. When it is, except that's not the totality of it. It has to start with me, which what is the vision for the feel, what we're trying to create. Because as we said in the beginning, people do things based off of feel, not off of logic. We, have, we are still emotional beings. The example of that is the parable of the elephant and the rider. The elephant represents the amygdala brain, the feelings and the emotions. Whereas the rider is the calculated. The rider is the human being on top that actually knows how to get from point A to point B in the most efficient way to do that. The rider is in control for part of the time, except for once the, the amygdala kicks in, which it happens in every single buying purchase, that's the reason people are staying with your business or leaving it. It's not because of your price. It's not because of the, it's because of this gut feeling that they have. And as a leaders, we have to understand that that gut feeling thing is the most important thing that we have. And that's why our driving mantra for our team is to build a tribe, build a tribe by making dope shit that creates a feeling. That's what we're trying to do. Now, what that, what that, and from there is we find the opportunities that come and present themselves to us and we figure out if this is in line with what we're trying to do. Is this dope? Is this going to help us build a tribe? Is it going to create a feeling? If it's not going to do those things, if it's not create a feeling, it's, it's transactional. Push it to the side. That's things like making better bells and whistles and all this other stuff. Instead of things that are really going to tug at heartstrings. That to me is the way you lead. You lead from the front, from the beginning, is create an understanding of what is it that we're trying to create, not from a 5,000 users, 10% churn, 23% profitability, and 10% growth. Like, cool, cool, but let's tug at the real things that move the needle, which is the emotion. Are you familiar with Goodhart's Law? Do you know what that is? I'm not. Okay, I'm so th that is exactly what you're describing. Goodhart's Law is an adage often stated as, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. It's named after a British economist, Charles Goodhart, who advanced the idea in 1975. So an example of that might be um, a target I want to achieve is uh, – a measure I want to achieve to base a target on is the number of email subscribers that I get. So I'm going to maximize the number of email subscribers. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say, put your email in here and I will send you a million pounds. 
thousands of people submit their email address, but you don't give them a million pounds. You have achieved the target that you wanted, but what you've actually, what you genuinely meant was, I want people to willingly give me their email address so that they are glad to receive emails from me on a weekly basis. That was the feel that you wanted. When you're relying on Goodhart's law, when you're looking at a measure becoming a target, it ceases to be a good measure. For sure. So like a great example of that is your churn rate, right? How many members are leaving every month versus how many did you start with at the beginning of the month? If you have a thousand members, a hundred leave during the month, your churn rate is 10%. Well, obviously let's lower the churn rate. Well, if that becomes, you can actually hack it, right? If you cut your price down to 10%, you're, more people are going to stay because there's just, it's, but to your point, that wasn't the intention. The intention of churn is to get people to want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> it's what it's what it's what Einstein said is that not everything that can be measured matters and not everything that matters can be measured. And that's why we can't get caught up in this data driven world that we have. And da- I'm not saying data is not important. Use every bit of it that you can. Just don't put blinders on because it's not the thing that only thing that matters. There are things that happen that we can not rationalize. This is one of the problems with dashboards for online businesses, for podcasts, for YouTube channels, stuff like that. Again, with YouTube, you could clickbait your way to maximizing yes. views, retention. Um, but really, what are you trying to achieve? Do you want to sell your soul to get to 500,000 subs? Well, probably not. Like You're going to arrive at the subscriber number that you said was the target and realize that actually it wasn't the outcome that your intention meant. So yeah, I think this this applies to a lot of things, right? You know, you could get yourself to, I, I want to look good in the mirror. Okay, I'm going to run at 500 calories for the next six months and dial myself down to some ridiculous body fat level. Again, like, yes, I've achieved the thing that I wanted, but what did I really mean? I probably meant I want to look and feel great and confident in my body. I want to feel powerful and mobile and fit and strong and attractive and all that stuff. Okay, is the solution that I've got oversimplified? And if it's oversimplified, I haven't actually got the outcome that I meant. Right. Yeah, this is, it kind of speaks to brand building, right? So in business, um, brand building is a really popular thing right now. And people, um, are chasing white rabbits and they think that brand building is brand awareness and brand awareness is not the key measure. It's brand relevance and resonance. It's like, what does it mean and how relevant are you in that person's life? And when you start to pull back that way a little bit, it's not just about how many people can become aware, you know, the top of the funnel awareness, how many, how can we make that bigger? It becomes you. You start to understand, which to your point is like, let's put up more banner ads, let's do more digital, let's put more. You start to recognize that that's not the means to the end. What we're actually trying to do is get people to feel better about our brand, and that happens through the sum of everything that we do, every single thing that you do for your podcast, everything it matters. Even the intangibles, the way that you're, the things that you can't measure, right? Which is the tonality in which you speak, the beautiful accent that you have. Like those can't be measured, but those are the things that drive the needle more than anything else that can be measured. I'm not saying that I'm not poo-pooing because we have a scoreboard, we have a dashboard. I'm I'm not saying uh, being ignorant, ignorant to that, but don't use that as the sole way to make decisions. Are there any unique advantages that you think you have as an introvert and as someone who was a, uh, not an unwilling leader, but an unlikely leader, maybe? Um, Are there any advantages that you think that you have from that position? There might be introverts that are listening who have to lead a team or be part of a team or take over decision making at some points. Is there a way that you look at that and see it as an advantage at all? Um. Yeah, I think that maybe I I don't have to backtrack on my words as much as like some of my outspoken friends do <laughs> because they'll just like without any filter system whatsoever, it just comes out, right? So that may be one. And I think it's – I am I try to be very intentional. Um, but this isn't an introvert thing. This is something I've learned along the way is 
early days in my in being a, a leader in the business, they used to call my team used to call them Ben bombs, right? Where they'd be chugging away, doing their thing, working hard, and I would come in with this new idea, this new great thing, and I'd be like so excited and pumped up to talk to them about it and be like, guys, this is listen to this, and like, and not realizing the ramifications that me kind of leaving that grenade there would have because as the leader of the business, when I say, Hey guys, this is so exciting. They go, okay, this is where we're going. And as a person that has lots of those thoughts, I've realized I've had to curtail that a bit. So this is kind of the opposite of like the intro, but, um, being an introvert to me, I'm in my head quite a bit. And I create the space purposefully because it gives me energy. And when I create the space, I have lots of thoughts on how to improve the business, on how to uh, move the needle, on how people are reacting to the business, of what I feel like the gut thing is that's going to drive people forward. Um, that kind of like as an introvert growing up and not being the center of attention, I would sit on the fringe of the circles and look and listen. Dude, that's, and, that's exactly what I had in my head. Like and look precisely. and listen to the way that words and body language and topics would resonate with people in the group. And um, I think it gave me a little bit of insight into a sensitivity to, um, you know, sort of like a, uh, you know, an EQ type thing, emotional intelligence sort of thing. Um I think also maybe even more so than the um, lack of willingness to be loud in front of people was my the way I went through school and being dyslexic. And being dyslexic, I had to find workarounds. They like like solutions weren't necessarily school and learning wasn't easy for me. And because of that, when I would read, I had to read so slowly to comprehend. I couldn't do what everyone else did, which is just, you know, read a chapter a night. Like it wasn't even a possibility. So I had to figure out how to read a lot slower for comprehension. And now that I'm reading things that I'm passionate about, I think that there's a comprehension. I, I un, That to me is the goal of reading is to comprehend and then be able to either apply or teach others. There's nothing else. There's no other reason for it. So every time that I'm reading something and I, I, I read a lot now, I'm constantly trying to figure out like, do I own this? Could I talk to somebody else about this or could I own this in the business? As opposed to I've found books that I don't feel like that with. And I realize that I find that the goal is to finish the book. And there's a dopamine thing of like finishing a book. Like I accomplish things. I get things done. And that can't be the goal. So I think that that learning aspect of you, the only reason to do this and probably because you're like, I never finished a book when I was in high school. So that wasn't even a goal anyways. It was just like, you got to get some comprehension out of this and try to, um, I think that's kind of uh, given me a little bit more, um, you know, I think that that dyslexic is giving me an advantage um, whereas in school, man, it was really, really challenging. You know, it, it's, it's such a big thing. And when you're school, at least the way that I went is like, you're, you're one of three things. Like you're either good looking and popular, you're an athlete and a jock and a stud, or you're smart and you get yourself worth out of that thing. And I wasn't super popular. I wasn't the star athlete. And I wasn't, and man, I was the opposite of what smart was the way smart was defined in academia, which is, Hey Ben, could you read the, the next page to the class out loud? And Holy crap. That's my, my, my nightmare because stuff, the word would just go fuzzy blank, stumbling on words. Um, and I would label myself as, um, not smart. But what I realized as I started getting into business was I had a huge advantage. My dad was um, also challenged, but incredibly good leader in business, um, CEO of multiple different companies, um, 
and then helped take companies public. Um, and I learned a lot watching him navigate the workplace, both from a worth ethic standpoint and how much common sense business is. And I think business is more common sense than it is academic. If you had such a critical inner voice when you were a kid, how have you got yourself to the stage now where you're talking about turning that critic into a coach? Like what have you done to move your self-talk from what sounds like a pretty shitty place to, yeah. to a much more um, positive place? So it's um, it's not binary. It's uh, meaning that it's not like I was terrible then and I'm great Fixed now. It now, yeah. Right. So um, certainly had negative self-talk in terms of academics and other things um, then. And I certainly don't have it all figured out right now. Um, I still have the inner voice and continue to work on it. Um, but the the words that you use there is exactly the way that I try to reframe it is coach versus critic. And the critic sits on the sidelines, doesn't get their hands dirty, and just points out all the faults. I think we all have – I shouldn't say all. A lot of us have that built into us for any number one of different reasons, right? Parents, teachers, coaches, upbringing, whatever it might have been. And I certainly do as well. And I think that the goal for most of us is first and foremost, become aware of the voice. 50% of people don't even believe that there's a voice in their head. <laughs> like that's a that's staggering to me because as an introvert that's all i listen to that shit blows my mind yeah exactly my yes. the voices in my set my head sing fucking barbershop together yeah <laughs> exactly so the first thing is becoming aware of the voice and then the next one is just an understanding that you don't need to try to control it the awareness on just by itself just the awareness of that voice is massive and that awareness, the more you become aware of it, when you just from the, because if you try to change it, you just get frustrated and you get depressed and you beat yourself up and the critic comes on top of the critic where you go like, um, they don't like what I'm saying right now. And then you become aware of that. And you go, oh my God, look at you. You're complaining. I'm the you sort go, oh of God, person well, that says they don't like what I'm saying right now. Yeah. On, you spin on that. Yep. And this is where you see people melt down in public speaking, right? They're giving a talk and all of a sudden they fumble on their words and they go, oh my God, you fumbled on your words. And you go, oh my God, you're fumbling on your words. Oh my, and it's and so- Shame laid on guilt, laid exactly. on shame, laid on guilt. So that's actually, to me, that is the path. Awareness. And then the next step is awareness without judgment. And when you create awareness without judgment, all of a sudden, now you start to realize the root causes. You figure out the triggers that set those things off. And now what you do is the next time that happens, you start to realize how you're pre-programmed. We are all are running a script that is pre-programmed into us from our childhood, and it is guiding our every action, decision, and behavior unnecessarily. It's a faulty script that doesn't actually exist. But your reality is different than my reality based off the script that we've experienced in the programming. Meaning, you um, are walking down the street and you hear a dog bark. And you grew up with a dog, a golden retriever that was super fuzzy and used to play with it in the park. And to you, dog, a dog barking is a sign of affection. That was your dog used to do before you would hear you come home and fumble with the keys. They used to bark and you go, I know when I open this door, my lovable four legged friend is going to give me so much of this feelings of oxytocin, all this stuff. So dog barking to you is warm and fuzzies. I was bit by a dog as a kid. So I hear dog barking and the opposite happens. Anxiety, stress. The reality is a dog barking. Neither one of those two belief systems are actual reality, but we believe certain realities only because of our past. When you start to sit quietly and have awareness of your thoughts, not judging, you start to recognize these triggers and you start to question them. You go, huh, that's just a, so you hear a dog bark. I feel a gut thing in my stomach start to turn and flip upside down. 
And instead of judging it, I just go, that's weird. Why did that happen? Ah, oh, the dog barked. That happened. The dog's not going to attack me. He's behind a closed door. Like, why the heck did that? And all of a sudden, you start to melt these paradigms. And you start to be able to navigate life without these triggers sending you into these fear loops, anxiety loops, or otherwise. Now let's bring that to another example. Your wife, after dinner, asks if you can do the dishes. You grew up with a very, very, very controlling mother. And when you wife asks you to do that, it sets off a trigger that you go, freaking wife trying to control me, telling me to do the dishes. Like, like what? No, she just asked you to do the dishes. But you have this program built into you that when somebody asks, it's a trigger. Instead, when wife asks you to do the dishes and you feel that thing, without you just go, whoa, awareness. Whoa, that was weird. I felt resentment towards my wife right when she said that. What's the reality of the situation right now? She's just asking if I can do the dishes. She's not trying to control me. That is actually built into me from my upbringing. It's the programming that I have. It's the software I'm running on. I have the opportunity to rewrite that software. This is that level of awareness that we can all navigate life through. We don't need to be the pre-programmed past. We have control over the way we navigate the future if we bring a level of awareness and non-judgment to that present moment. Going back to the team thing, how do you get team members to respect the leader? Because one thing that I've realized throughout running businesses is that the leader often needs to show degrees of outstanding competence in order to get respect from the team. So we run nightclubs and we have junior managers, normal managers, senior managers, city managers, right? All of the guys that are effective at being any of the senior levels, they have to be performing well week in, week out. And their performance is so transparent because everyone can see how many entries they've got into all of our different events. The The guys that had the most respect weren't the ones that were the sternest leaders. They weren't the ones that were even necessarily the best team leaders. They got buy-in from the people below them because they knew that they had talent and competence. But when you get to more complicated organizations, more specialized uh, decision-making uh, situations like CEO of a big online business or coaching a team, it's not your job to be fitter than your athletes. It's your job to be the guy that knows exactly what to tell them. So how do teams, how do you get team members to respect the leader and then talk about this sort of competence dynamic that plays into that? Yeah, absolutely. So competence is absolutely one of the pieces. But it's not the only piece. And the reason competence helps a leader lead is because when someone shows competence, the people that they're leading will trust that person more. Because if you show that you're making the right decisions and then it, things turn out well, or you give some career advice, people take it and then they run with it. That just brings some level of trust. But trust is a three-faceted piece, competence being one of them. It's not the first one. The first thing you have to show, it's the three C's of trust. The first one is showing that you care. Because even the competent leader will not get everything they can out of them, like the Bobby Knights, the guy that like yells and screams at his players, you know, but doesn't show any sort of level of care for them whatsoever, but he's very competent. He knows the X's and O's of his sport as well as anybody else will not get every ounce of potential out of his athletes or employees or family or whatever it might be. The first thing we have to show is that we care about people on an individual basis. And this is why, you know, the saying is it takes 40 hours just to get to past acquaintance level. It takes time. It takes a lot of time to actually get to the level where somebody goes like, I can trust that person because they care about me. And this is built into our evolutionary biology. If you were, um, a you know, you were a tribe of 150 that lived around a certain huge cave and you had campfires, you had certain hunters, you had certain warriors, you had certain people that cooked the food and certain people that tanned the hides and certain people that took care of the kids. You needed to know that the person next to you cared about you. If they didn't care about you, no matter how good of a warrior they were, no matter how good, how competent they were in their skill set, it didn't create the total package. 
Because you go like, listen, that person's really good. When they talk to me about warrior stuff, I'll listen. But I'm not going to turn my back on that person. It's not total trust. Because they might have bigger, higher goals and they might knock me off. So it has to start with care. Then the next one is exactly what you said, competence. You have to know your stuff. You have to be good at what you do. And the next one is consistency. You have to show up every day. You have to be th- – you have to have a through line, just as what you were saying. It was kind of nice having Dana White there, that consistency level. That just in itself brings some trust to the organization because you know that some of the past is going to be present and the future is probably going to be fairly stable because of what they've shown you. It's been consistent. If there was a different leader in place every single year of the UFC, your trust in the UFC would not be what it is today. So that three-headed monster of care, consistency, and trust is how you start leading groups. Then when you're introduced to the groups, that's kind of like the macro overarching thing. Then there's a step-by-step process to when you are inserted as the leader. And some people come in and flip over the poker table and they go, this is the way we're doing it, my way or the highway, and they totally throw everything in. Like That doesn't bring as much trust because people don't know if you care, they don't know if you're competent, and there's no consistency. So what do you do instead when you come in? Step one is you listen. This is what helps introverts and leadership positions is you don't come in. Don't let your ego take over. Literally come in. Even if you are the most senior position, you're the CEO of the business, come in and spend your first two weeks just listening. Listening to people, understanding them, what makes them tick, understanding their roles and responsibilities, understanding everything that you possibly can so that you can step two, learn, listen and learn. If you were in my position, what changes would you make? How would you do your job differently? What are you seeing as inefficiencies? What are you seeing as things that we should be doing going forward? Step three is help and help in any which small way, right? So an example of this is um, Ted Lasso. Are you familiar with Ted Lasso? No, who's that? Oh my gosh. It's a a show on um, Apple TV. He's a coach that comes in to uh, run a English premier soccer league. He has no idea what he's doing, but right away he just comes in and the first, what he does is he listens to people, learns what they're, has people write down suggestions. And one of the things that people said is like, on this professional soccer team is the shower pressure sucks in the locker room. So the next day there's better shower pressure. You help, you make changes no matter how small, listen, learn, and then help. After you help, then you lead. What too many leaders do is they come in with an ego and go, I have to establish myself as the leader. I have to tell people what to do. I have to show people what they're doing wrong and the new direction we're going. And because of that, they haven't taken the necessary steps to work through this the way our evolutionary biology does is it's constantly going friend or foe, friend or foe, friend or foe. Because if it's foe, I need to fight or flight. Only two options. I need to either resist this guy because he might be trying to take my job, hurt me in any shape or form, or get the hell out of here, find a new job. Until I feel like he is friend, which is the person that's going to help me at the campfire, support me and care about me, then I can't lead. You can't lead. And by the way, this is I didn't create this. George Washington's that is the listen, uh, learn, help, then and only then lead. It's kind of like the same thing with like mechanics, consistency, then and only then intensity. Same thing. Listen, learn, help, then and only then lead. Because if you don't, you're going to have people following you reluctantly. And that's not a leader. That's a positional leader. Mm. I had Eddie Jones, head coach of England rugby on the show a little while ago. uh, And it turned out that he was up in Newcastle. So I went for breakfast with him. I got his email address and unsolicited, just asked him to go for breakfast the next day. And we did. And he told me this story about, first off, he told me a story about Sir Alex Ferguson, who was Manchester United's manager for a very long time, maybe 20 years, something like that. Uh, and when he first came into the club, there was a lot of turmoil and he needed to get the players on side with him quickly. So what he did was, one of the players tells this story separately about how every 
game for the entire rest of the season after Alex had joined, Alex had gone up to this player and said to him, you are the most important player on the pitch. It is all about you today. You are the most important player. And it only turned out toward the end of the season, he started chatting to a couple of the other guys. It turned out that Alex had been saying that to every single one of them. Love that. Because he needed all of them to feel like they had that bond, but he needed to expedite it. He didn't have time to wait to actually be able to work through stuff. And he's become one of the most successful soccer coaches of all time. Another story that Eddie told me, so this guy is in charge of our Rugby World Cup hopes, right? 2023 Rugby World Cup's coming around. And this is the man who has coached, played for Australia, coached Australia, Japan, and England, all at separate uh, times. He was a school supply replacement teacher as well for sport, but also taught everything. So he's literally from the lowest... 13-year-old boys picking up a rugby ball for the first time to the best teams on the planet, right? He's done the entire thing. And I was asking him because he was going to go and watch this game afterward. I said, so what are you looking for? You're going to go watch these guys. There's, whatever, 30 people plus some referees plus some physios. It's like 35 people on the pitch. What are you looking for? He said, well, first off, I'm getting rid of all the noise. So I get rid of the players that I'm not looking at. And I look at the players. But at least 50% of what I'm focused on when I'm watching the players at the game, isn't their time during the game. It's how are they interacting with the coaches during the warm-up? What's their body language like if the score starts to go in their their direction or if if the game starts to go against them? Do they keep their head down or do they keep their head up? He told me another story about when he took over the Japanese team and Japan wasn't particularly good at rugby. Asian men uh, typically aren't built for that sort of a sport, especially if you put up up against what like Pacific Islanders, like a Samoan versus a, a Japanese guy. Typically, you're going to get flattened by the Samoan. Um, so he was trying to make them fast and do other bits and pieces. And one of the lessons that he was looking for um, in when he observes the players is how much they look at the coaches. He says that he wants players that take the game plan and then they work for themselves. And he'd spoken to uh, apparently Japan's good at three things um women's volleyball like women's downhill skiing and something else right Uh, so he went to go and speak to the women's volleyball coach and i didn't know this because i haven't watched that much volleyball but apparently the coaches from volleyball are right on the side of the court so they're right next to the players and the coach came in he didn't take your softly softly approach he took a slightly he took the flip the poker table uh over approach and he watched the game and the players that kept looking to him during the match, all of them were binned. All of them went. And he said, I want players that can play for themselves. And now Eddie's taken that forward. So he's watching this game and maybe there's two or three players on the pitch on a match that he's looking at. And he's looking at what's their body language like before they begin? How are they interacting with the rest of the staff? How are they warming up? Are they doing it with enthusiasm? Are they looking like they're positive? What's their body language like if they start to win or if they start to lose? And how much are they able to focus on their own game? Or how much are they looking at the coach for the equivalent of audibles and plays? And to hear that from one of the most respected sports coaches on the planet was that was fuck. It was a, a good breakfast. Super cool. Love those stories. It's you know one of the sayings is you're not a leader until you've created a leader that has created a leader. Because what we're trying to do is empower people. That's real. I mean, otherwise, what you do is you're a micromanager. And to the, to the case in point of what the, those coaches on the athletic fields were looking for is they need people that can go and lead others and lead, lead themselves and lead others. And that's super cool. Empowerment is, um, you know, I believe it's, a, it's one of the biggest traits that anybody can have as a leader is get people that are smarter in the room than they are and empower them to make decisions and lead themselves. I, I also really like the you know, the the coach that was not necessarily just looking at the players playing, but the players, because, you know, their body language, what are they, how are they interacting with each other? You know, I, that's what I look for uh, when I'm coaching my athletes a ton is I, I, you're giving me words to this, but about 50% is execution, right? It's, Um, how efficient are they being with the movements? How are they cycling a barbell? Is their muscle up transition smooth? All the rest. But the other 50% is what I'll call vibe. 
and it is the intangibles and it is um, how are they handling themselves when they're walking on the floor, when they're walking off the floor, when they're setting the barbells up, when um, they're between rounds. Like there's so much to be gleaned and gained from awareness of that aspect of coaching as well. And I believe it translates really well to an organization and a business because part of what we do, about 50%, is the actual X's and O's. You know, are we producing the widgets? Are the widgets up to the standards of expectations? But the other 50% is how do people interact as a team? And the whole kind of vibe aspect of this. And in the, the, the recent book that I, I wrote, I, I speak to this and I got it from the guys that own 11 Madison Park, which is a restaurant in New York City that got voted as the best restaurant in the world. And there's the back of the house and there's the front of the house. The back of the house is where the chefs are and um, dishwashers and all that. Then there's the front of the house where the, um, the servers are and the concierge and all the rest. And the guy that's in charge of the front of the house, that's a, your experience, it's not just about the quality of the food, it's about the experience of the whole thing. I think restaurants are just such amazing businesses to, to dissect because they kind of have everything. They have product, they have service, they have um, this, you're only in there for a short period of time. You, if no one decides to come to the restaurant that day, they go out of business. It's like, it's wild to me. It's not like a, the safety of an annuity, like a subscription service or something else. So, but the, the guy that owns the place and the guy that's in front of the front of the charge in charge of the front of the house, he would, um, what I call soft eyes where he would just go to a corner of the restaurant, sort of close his eyes, but not completely. And just listen. And the way he said it was, you can just feel when it's a good night. There's a certain excitement in the air. And I think that translates to managing any team. I'm a big believer in becoming really good at having good meetings. Because I think that having a good meeting is essentially that to me is the team actually performing. And you want to, as a leader, it's very important to get your team to actually be good at being good at meetings. And it sounds weird because what everyone thinks their job is to be good at their job. But if you have a whole bunch of star performers, there's, I mean, there are so many examples of teams with multiple all-stars on them that perf way underperform. What you actually need is a good team. And when your team truly comes together is in meetings. And I think that that is a massively underutilized aspect because I think that um, poor leaders do it in a very transactional way where they think the goal is for to get, you know, uh, me to tell you everyone here what's happening. And as long as that happens, the meeting was a success. And that's not the case. The case of meeting is to get people to feel empowered and to get people to feel connected to the overall vision and direction of the organization. And that is one of the ways that we can do that is by with the, the soft eyes, the empowering, and just get the feel of how are we working together as a team. That's expertise. That's the role of the leader right? The, the guy at the top or the guys at the top, their job is to be a hard to replicate complex decision engine. They can't precisely tell you all of the things that they've taken in, mm -hmm. but they aggregate all of the different stuff. So I'm sure that you do the same, but when I'm running a club night, I don't want to be near the front door. I want to be 30 yards away from the front door and I can see where 
the guys that are scanning tickets aren't leaving gaps for people to move through. I can see where we're getting held up with the door staff at the front. I can see that the smoking area is encroaching and that the barriers have changed. I can see that there's that group of guys over there that aren't going to get in because they don't have student ID. But if we let them wait and they get to the front, they're going to be pissed off because they've just waited for 20 minutes. But the queue picker, the guy whose job it is, he hasn't seen them. All of this stuff happens the same as you in your gym. I, I imagine that if you want to get a feel for how the class is going, you don't stand in the middle of the class. You stand right at the very, very far edge and you just, exactly right. that soft air, eyes, open gaze, you're just looking across the entire gym. And that's where, uh, that, that's one of the beautiful things. That's why I, or anyone would enjoy watching someone in flow at something that they're great at. I would enjoy watching you watching your gym I would enjoy watching the guy that runs the front of house of that fancy restaurant observing his restaurant because you're seeing someone aggregate millions of bits of data and then come just come up with one thing, the one thing that's going to have the highest impact. Okay, where is it that that queue, that group of guys, that smoking area, that queue from the coach, that fact that the person over the far side is the one person that hasn't yet been spoken to by any of the guys that look, whatever it is, right? That table that we know that hasn't had the wine, whatever it, whatever it might be. Like, that's fucking awesome to see. Like, I nerd out over expertise like that so much. I think it's amazing to see people that have that level of competence. Yeah, I love that. That's a... Uh... It's, it's so, I love what you're saying is like computing like the millions of data points all together. And if you ask somebody to break that down, you can't, you just have to, you just know it intuitively because it's been built into you from so many, it's kind of like the, the expert, the, the fire chief, right? The fire chief is in the building. They're all fighting the fires and without any, he just goes, guys, let's we get, gotta out. get out of here. Yep. Exactly. There's no, he can't point to anything. It's just this feeling. There's loads of stories that is, like that from 9-11 as well. Exactly the absolutely. same thing. There's, there's so many stories like that. And it's what you were saying is I can just tell that those guys, with this, those are students. They're not going to they're not, And we got to make sure that we're not – it's it's a, it's, a, it's a built into you and that's what the level of – that's the competence piece. That's where you, you, you get to display your level of expertise. Who is one of the athletes that's had the best vibe that you've worked with? Is there someone that you put them in the gym and everybody else just gets in a better mood? Everyone's on a, a, a good level? Uh, Katrin, definitely. Katrin's like phenomenal. Katrin is, um, uh, you know, but she wasn't always like that. Katrin used to be kind of an emotional um, when she was first starting off in, as a competitor in our sport. Um, but Katrin is awesome. Katrin is um, a, a fierce competitor, but also makes everyone feel um, feel good about things. I think you've mentioned in the past that her and your wife are kind of similar, apparently like girly and giggly and they get excited about stuff yeah. and you're a bit more sort of reserved, stiff upper lip British sort of standoffish <laughs> type thing. And um, you, you're so right that that vibe element of having having a a Catherine or a Mrs. Bergeron or whatever like in the team, especially if you have a male dominated team, fuck, it is so important to have someone that just brings a bit of lightness and and fun and energy to the situation that isn't this super intensity that I think a lot of guys try and fix men try and fix situations by drilling down into focus more by trying to grip things harder and that often takes you further away from flow rather than into it it adds pressure on as opposed to releasing it and i think yeah having having those sorts of uh characters makes a big difference absolutely yeah i love the 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 references to a flow state because whether it's my athletes or my employees my team that's the goal right that is where the best of you comes out it literally flows out of you because it's not being interrupted by that the logical thinking brain, which is slow and too calculated. You could, you know, that um, whether it's you uh, putting on the nightclub or the restaurateur or the fire chief, that's that's just something that comes and oozes out of them. And having people that keep it um, not so heavy. Uh, for sure is an asset.
There's a quote, team. a quote from you that says, the harder you try, the more elusive flow is. And yeah. fuck, man, if that's not true. But there's a, there's a real difficulty. I think it was like a bar of soap that you're trying to grab. But, and like, it's but, like but, this, this, yeah, and like, oh, I got to, and the more you try to like focus, the more you try to focus on how to grab, the, the harder it gets. There's a tension here though, between balancing desire and grit and effort with ease and presence and intuition and gut. And especially I imagine in a sport, but also especially in something like podcasting is a good example. If you try really, really hard, you end up being shit. Like the goal is to just ease yourself into it. How do you encourage a team, especially in a sport that is reliant on grit, determination, resilience, digging your heels in, getting serious about the lift, getting serious about the workout? How do you balance that grit and effort with ease and presence? Okay, so the, the number one thing that pulls people out of a flow state is a distraction. So it makes sense, right? You're you're plugging away. You're writing your your beautiful manuscript. You're um you're you're shooting baskets and everything's falling. You're um doing whatever it is that you, you do. You and it, things are just, it's it's amazing. But then a car horn goes off, or somebody um uh, punches you in the the back, or um, somebody turns the temperature up to uh or someone throws water in your face, like. Like th those distractions are going to pull you out of a flow state. Those are not the common distractions. The common distractions are the voice in your head. That's the distraction that we, most of us are fighting. And that distraction is throwing things forward. What are the consequences of my actions right now? That's usually what pulls people out of a flow state. So they get too caught up in what they're doing right now. And they're thinking about it too much. So imagine an athlete that you that is about to take the game-winning shot in a basketball game. And he's going, okay, if I make this shot, that means bigger sponsorships, more uh, bigger contract. Everyone's going to love me. If I miss this shot, holy crap, the whole team's going to – I'm being tasked with this. That, all of that is – if once that starts, you're out of flow. You're go it's, it's gone. It's a bar of soap that you can not grab onto. The more you try, the harder it is. So it has to be this trained level of um, being present. And this is where like mindfulness has become so popular in sports because what mindfulness is, is the ability to stay present, open-minded without judgment. What that means is it allows you, it does not going to put you, but it allows for a flow state. If any one of those three things doesn't happen, if you're not open-minded, you're closed-minded, that's, that's, that's antagonistic to a flow state. If you're not positive, you're negative, going like, oh, this is going to fucking suck. This is going to be terrible. I'm going to miss this shot. You're out. And you're judging. Okay, what is this going to be good or is it going to be bad? Michael Jordan was able to get in a flow state more than anybody else in his sport. He goes, why would I worry about taking a shot I haven't even taken yet? So he doesn't worry about anything because once – he's not going to worry about taking a shot before he takes it because why, why would you ever worry about that? He takes it. Why is he going to judge what – it's gone. It's already happened. It's in the past. So he's just constant. It's literally the ability to stay in the here and now, and that's way easier said than done. That is a massive challenge. We have this infatuation right now in society with being present. And it's because people are consumed with their phones. And when you're consumed with the phone, your head is in the screen. You're not actually experiencing life where your feet are. Well, that's like the lowest level of presence. <laughs> there are so many different levels of being present. And the highest level of presence is actually pure consciousness where you are just operating in a flow state, which is again, living with pure enlightenment and joy. And there is no good or bad. As Shakespeare said, there is no good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So stop your fucking thinking and just experience the moment now. If we could shut our brains off as athletes, we could experience 
everything that we have the potential to experience, which is so beyond our wildest dreams. It is the the middle-aged woman lifting the car off of her baby. That is like what we are capable of, but we don't do that because we put these self regulators, these invisible ceilings and limitations on us that keep us from operating at our fullest potential. Our fullest potential is us in a flow state. And we've all experienced it at certain times in our lives, one way or another. It's either you running your nightclubs and it's like, it's just going, or you doing a podcast or your Ted talk and it's just flowing out. Other people have done it when they're composing music or skiing in powder or um, they're swimming and all of a sudden they feel like they're, there's no effort, they can breathe. It's just like we've all had these little glimpses of it. What the, the thing that we are all aspiring to do is to live in a perpetual state of flow, pure consciousness, finding God, heaven on earth, whatever that thing is our true best selves. And that's why I believe that athletics is such a powerful tool for us to become our best selves because it can show us what those flow states look like. One of the interesting things that Stephen Kotler said, I know you're a fan of his work as well. He's been on your show and mine. And he talks about the fact that emotion knocks us out of flow as easily as anything else, or in fact, even more easily. So task switching, you switch from doing one thing to another, it takes you about 20 minutes to go back in. Flow is precisely the same. And he said that an emotion, if you have an emotion arise, and this is one of the problems with if you're trying to write a manuscript or a a blog post or an article or an email or something, and you still have your notifications on and something pops up and it's good or bad or whatever, that's just kicked you out of flow for 20 minutes. And there's something... This is something that I'm playing around with more that an embodied practice like a CrossFit, like a bike ride, like a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a boxing, a whatever, yoga, Pilates, fucking Tai Chi. There's something to me easier to drop into flow when I'm doing something physical than when I'm doing something mental because I'm able to, the goal is to switch the mind off, but when you're doing something that requires a ton of cognition, you're switching the mind on to switch the mind off and it kind of can feel it feels to me more difficult um but there's a a virtual reality shooting range bar in the city where i live and one of their games that they have is about two minutes long five different targets pop up every three seconds you have to hit them so you go like ding 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 and then it'll change again I swear to God, that is the quickest way to get into a flow state. One of the guys stopped doing it and he turned around and he said, dude, you could have told me that my mother had died halfway through me doing that and I wouldn't have registered what you'd said. So there's something about a physical activity and that's why I think sports and pursuits like CrossFit, where you have a class where you've kind of externalized the thinking brain to the coach. Coach is telling you what to do. You don't need to think, oh, well, is it? 21 reps or should i maybe actually do only 15 because i'm feeling a bit tight it's like no the, the workout says it's 21 so you do 21 all of that externalizing all of that physicality i think that that especially after the last two years people have probably forgotten the fact that a physical pursuit like that is just it's inherently fulfilling forget the health benefits the longevity the mus- musculature the leanness all that stuff it's inherently fulfilling because you get out of your head for 45 minutes or 60 minutes of the day yeah, absolutely. I can't, I couldn't I couldn't agree with that more. Um I think that part of that, the physicality part, um, is also though because you're an athlete and because you inherently um enjoy it. Whereas somebody else that's getting off the couch for the first time, they're they're trying to do something physical and their their inner voice is just screaming at them because they're full of I don't fit in here. You're never going to achieve this. This, And that's why I think that certain people um, find it in their own ways. And some people sitting down, just writing. Oh, fuck. For some it. people, like, it'll be music. If you put me down in front of a, a, put me down in front of a fucking piano. That, so that's why people get addicted to this performance thing of music. Like music is so – because it gets people into a flow state. It's, it's just a 
especially performing it. Listening to it is one thing, but if you're performing music, and I can't imagine the feeling of performing music in front of like tens of thousands of people. That to me would just be like the ultimate. Well, you of, feel of that. Stuff. You feel right. that even from the crowd. Yes. You go to a huge concert and you feel this. It's called collective effervescence in the social psychology literature. You don't know the person that's 50 yards in front of you, and yet you're moving in the same way, and yet you're thinking the same sort of things, and your emotions are working in resonance. And this isn't some fucking magnetic woo-woo Rhonda Byrne, the secret field shit. This is you and them are emotionally in the same sort of state because of what you're observing on stage. And what you're observing on stage is a musician in flow, performing something which is toward the limit of their capacity, and it's beautiful and terrifying and awe-inspiring and dread-inspiring all at the same time. And everyone moves together. No one's, nobody outside said, right, guys, so we're all going to do this dance move yeah. at this point. So why the fuck did everybody coordinate? Well, because everybody's right. in the same place. That's super cool. Yeah, it's, uh, which I get what Kotler's saying in terms of like emotion is a fast way to knock you out of it. But I, I might caveat that with certain emotions, anxiety, fear, dread, um, judgment, yes, but feelings of elation, love, um, connectedness, those are emotions too. And um, you know, the biggest wave surfers in the world feel connected to the wave. If we say feel connected, feel is an emotion. What they're not is judging, am I going to survive this thing? What they're not doing, it's like, you know, climbing so, the free solo up El Capitan, like total flow state at one with the wall. All of a sudden, this thing he struggled with for months and months and months became, if not effortless, like enjoyable, right? It was like, there's this level of an enjoyment is a feeling. So, and in flow state, there is a feelings of enjoyment. So it, there is, nothing will knock you out of a flow state faster than a negative emotion. That might have actually been what he said. I yeah, might have just so, misquoted him there. Yeah, so I think that that's a, a big level of awareness because we want people um, feeling the vibe because the vibe is, the, is, is so key to that. Talking about Katrin and the guys, you've had some big changes recently. You've had some coaches and some big name athletes that have moved on. How do you manage a period of turbulent change like that? So the first recognition is that change is inevitable. It's a, it's 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 part of um, our world and our universe. We start whether you believe that we started as a pin sized thing that exploded and now we're this universe, or you believe that we are Adam and Eve, or you believe that we you know crawled out of the oceans, grew legs, and like change is and it's the only constant is change. So that's one of the the big aspects of that. Um, and then the next is just perspective. So, um, one of the one, things you're alluding to is Katrin, who is the athlete that I trained that won the CrossFit games a couple times. Um, super close, looked at her as like, uh, above a best friend, almost like a daughter lived with us for years and years and years, uh, recently decided to move back to Iceland. So the perspective there is if you don't take perspective, you go like, Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. What do you mean? We had such a good thing going like, but the, the reality and the perspective is like, oh my gosh, what, how amazing was this? I can't believe that you gave up the last seven years of your life to leave your family in Iceland to move and live and train with me in Boston. What an amazing, awesome experience that I am so grateful for. It also makes total sense that you want to go back to Boston. You are now 20 you know, eight years old, your life is happening. You have a real meaningful relationship with a significant other. You bought an apartment a couple of years ago that you have yet to have the opportunity to live in. You're getting a dog. Your sister is having babies. Your best friends are having babies and getting married. I understand like, so it's perspective of understanding where we are. And it would be, once you put it in that through that lens, it actually kind of sounds ridiculous to think anything otherwise. So to me, you know, I, I think of it and we talked to the, started the conversation off with those three um, pillars of awareness, intention, and action. 
I like to put all of those with the prism of perspective on top of all of it. We can't get wrapped up in our own little tiny little worlds. It is something is bigger than us. And we, we like to have the entire world operate the way that we want it to. And if things don't go our ways, we get all bent out of shape. Well, that's kind of ridiculous. There's 7.5 billion people on planet Earth. And in our little world, we want everyone to act, think, and behave exactly like we want them to. And if they don't, we get all bent out of shape. To the tiniest little things of like someone said something about you on social media, to you show up to a party and someone's wearing the same things as you, to someone that was close to you decides to move away. Like this is the reality of the world. Like nothing we have is going to line up exactly the way we want it to. Whether even if you're a tree, it's going to be windier than you want, colder than you want, and rain more than you want. Or it might be too sunny longer than you want. You're not getting enough rain. But no one experiences, no one, no thing experiences life on their terms. You don't. You don't have that much control. And I like, I think that we think that we have more control than we do. And when you allow yourself the opportunity to just let go of those things that you don't control, man, it's a whole lot easier to navigate these challenges and these changes in our lives. Is it not hard to feel fear or self-doubt or whatever when you've got that turbulence going on? Or are you able to bypass that with perspective? You know, so if you had asked, if, if um, like Katrin leaving, if that had happened six years ago, I probably, it probably would have been pretty, a, a pretty darn big moment and not in a good way. Um, I think I've been able to ha- kind of navigate the world through this prism for a little while of uh, uh, perspective, even still, it's not like sunshine, rainbows, brick paved road going forward. It's still like, gosh, dang, like that would have been still cool, but that's pretty darn short. I can, so for an example, when Katrin told me, um, she was in Iceland at the time. She always went back to Iceland after the games. She went to Iceland and the, the conversation I was having with her was um, on the phone. I was at my daughter's um, – my daughter plays collegiate lacrosse. I was at her college lacrosse game between games, called Katrin, scheduled a call, and was like um, – we were just talking about – and we were talking about when you're coming back. And she's like, you know, I think I might stay. And I – the initial gut reaction wasn't one of like, what was me? It was not, what do you, it was not of question. It was, which I'm really proud of, honestly, this, because this is something that's been, um, it was, um, gratitude. It was gratitude for having had the opportunity. And that was, I, I was like, I, I actually hung up the phone, um, went and talked to, my wife, I didn't tell my daughter. My daughter's incredibly close to um, Katrin um, because I didn't want to affect her next game. But after my daughter left for her next game, I just said, um, Katrin's going to stay in Iceland. I'm not going to work with her as a coach anymore. Um, and she said, how do you feel? And I was like, I'm totally okay with this. And she's like, I'm not surprised. Because we've been working on this for a long time. We've done a lot of self-exploration, a lot of spiritual journey, a lot of meditating, a lot of personal growth um, to where something that would have rocked me five years ago um, was a, a bump, not a rock. Now, having said that, there was still angst when we were – what's funny is I, I know I'm not enlightened or anything close to that yet because when we decided to announce this to people, um, I got the feelings. And it's, that's, that was weird to me is like, I still got the feelings of like that gut feeling that, that uneasy feeling of like, you're about to go on and give a presentation they're not prepared for that. Like, Oh, this is, this sucks type thing. So what do you think? That's a, have, why do you think that is? What do you think that's about? Great question. A judgment. Of, I'm so fearful of judgment of other people. Yeah. I'm not there. Um, I'm more at peace with my own, who I am as a person 
but I'm still not there where I don't give a crap about what other people think yet. And I go back and forth on that a little bit. You know, they, they say like, you should, you know, when you're completely enlightened, you shouldn't let the opinions of other people affect you whatsoever. And I know I'm not there yet because I don't believe that. I honestly don't believe it. So I have a lot of either a lot of growth to do, or that's just not the case because um, I think that if I and I don't I don't I don't feel like I need to justify myself along the way every single step I take, but I do believe that uh, I shouldn't say I believe what people's other other people's opinions still matter to me. I'm just not a total grown up yet. Dude, bypassing that limbic system is superhuman, you know? Being able to not track whatever it is, whatever the system is that your brain thinks is being activated there, whether it's the potential fall in status, whether it's the whatever the concerns are around other people's impressions of you, this is driven into us millions and millions of years of evolution i mean what is it that people say heights and public speaking are two of the greatest fears that humans have you think well yeah one's a mortal threat the other one's just awkward but why is it that that's the case well it's because the eyes of the tribe being on you and if you fail then you're going to fall in their standing and that's survival that's reproduction man like to to get past that to be able to front brain think your way out of the thing that gatekeeps all of your thoughts to the rest of your body is when you get there, let me know. Like, because yeah, that's what, that's what I think we should all be striving for, you know, because that's flow. What's happened is I should be living my life in pure consciousness, pure. Here's what I think we should all be shooting for. We should all be shooting for unconditional happiness. Now that word unconditional, when I first came across it, floored me. Unconditional means without condition, regardless, no matter what. So if I ask you, Chris, do you want to be happy? You're going to say, everyone's going to respond, yes. And I say, are you willing to be happy no matter what? And you go, yes. And I go, that means even if you're... You, your, your wife tries to stab you. You are going to, you love her no different. Even if you lose everything, every single person that you've ever come in contact with says, Chris is a bad person. Like, even if, um, you're outside, you forgot your jacket, it starts pouring rain and and you go like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, like, well, I'm willing to be happy, but not if I lose my job, not if I lose my wife, not if I get cancer. Not, and now you're putting conditions on it. And what we should all be aspiring to is unconditional and just slowly eliminating the conditions. So there are certain things now that don't bug me that used to bug me, right? Um, someone saying something about me on social media doesn't really bug me that much anymore. Um, but Katrin saying something about me would bug me. So I'm not, we're not quite there yet. And that's where, if we can get there, that's unconditional. And that is enlightened. And that's where the monks are, right? That's where, but the best thing is to not have to go into a monastery, wear a robe and meditate for 20 hours a day to get there. You want to be able to find that while still navigating everyday life, being a father of four, running a business, driving in traffic, and you know, going to um, kids' birthday parties on the weekends. When you can do it in that state, that to me is the jam. That is the thing that we should all be shooting for. And it takes awareness, intentionality, and action to get there. Write the fucking book, man. I'm telling you, write the <laughs> write the book. The world needs it. Uh, ben Bergeron, ladies and gentlemen, uh, new book, Unlocking Potential, will be linked in the show notes below. Where else should people go if they want to keep up to date with what you do? Uh, probably the easiest place is Instagram, just at Ben Bergeron. Um, and then uh, if people want to, 
uh, jump on the book. It's on Amazon and um, Comp Train is the training platform. So um, in the uh, Apple Store, um, Comp uh, Comp Train. train and hard live life. Chasing Excellence podcast. Shout out, Patrick. There we go. And a podcast. Ben, it's always <laughs> a pleasure, man. I really, really appreciate you coming on. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.